Welcome to On Top of the Covers, a weekly podcast by Or Love, dedicated to all of you amazing people that tune in every single week, the creative visionaries, the entrepreneurs and artists, the makers, disruptors around the world. All of you guys are creative. You're, you're constantly building, you're constantly designing and rethinking how to do things, which you guys know if you tuned in for a while with me is like one of my, you know, like prerequisites, right, for conversation. How are we always pushing the envelope? And, you know, on this show, we feature a lot of inspirational stories of people contributing to the culture of music, how they do it creatively, artistically, personally, professionally. You know, we're really about these unconventional paths. And for those of you that are new, I'm Matt Gottesman. It's nice to meet you. I'm your host. I'm director of the Orlove Brands. Uh, you guys can reach out to me on Instagram at Matt Gottesman. Uh, for many of you, you know, I've been answering each and every single text, DM, reply, response, for the last eight years, I love you guys. You guys are amazing. And the feedback is always incredible. And of course, you can follow at We Are Or Love. Please do. Please leave us feedback there. And, you know, we always say that music is one of our biggest connectors in the world, right? It's this common bond we're all sharing. And so we open up these conversations, not just of art, but, you know, the contributors uh, to this art uh, from a business to the creative, everything in between, you know, the missions behind it. And as I mentioned, we really want to show these unconventional ways and paths to success. So we're going to dive right in. We have another incredible guest who I was just talking with for a little bit before we started. Her name is Micah Nolte. Nolte, and she'll and she'll correct me, I'm sure, on my on my pronunciation of her last name. But um, amazing human being already just in connecting the short time period. She's head of artist and community relations at Beatport. Just a little small company named Beatport, which does incredible work. And we're going to dive into everything that they're doing. And we're going to be talking about emerging artists, how to release and sell music, more specifically on Beatport. And, you know, we're we're in a very unique time that uh, I was just telling Micah that like, I've been probably preaching this for about, I don't know, 18, 20 years, <laughs> that artists have a lot more artistic and creative freedom as we move further in with technology depending on how uh, you play the journey game <laughs> and the management of, of, your, of your music and the resources and tools. But now more than ever, we have incredible tools at our disposal to really use for our management, our publishing, our distribution, our community engagement, everything, right? And it's an exciting time for emerging artists. And I've always encouraged a lot more creative ownership. So we're going to talk about all these different things. But real quick, as I mentioned, Micah is with Beatport. She's been there since 2016 as a label manager and now heads up uh, the artist and community relations department from the company's Berlin office. She is the main content at Beatport for artist managers, bookers, press managers, and other external partners, creating and executing creative concepts for content marketing and social media campaigns. So basically everybody that's listening, <laughs> it's like, yeah. you gotta go, you gotta go through her. Um, and, um, you know, doing incredible work there. And, and then while completing a master's thesis, she started her career as an intern in the promotion department at the electronic music label WMF Records. And then over the next decade, she went on to oversee the promotion and marketing department at seminal techno labels Minus and Plus 8, working alongside Richie Houghton, led her to the role of head of international promotion and marketing at Ellen Alien's B Pitch Control, running successful campaigns for artists such as Alien, Paul Kalkbrenner, Mode Selector, Moderat, and Dylan. And then in 2012, she moved on to the streaming service uh, WIMP, WIMP, which became Tidal, uh, responsible for the German office as country manager the following year. And everybody knows Beatport, but I'm still going to give a, a massive shout out to this company. They're a worldwide home of music for DJs, producers, and their fans. Again, you guys, if you're not already there or familiar, just run, run there. <laughs> and it was founded in 2004. And uh, the Beatport family of companies includes Beatport, the preeminent store for electronic music um, DJs, Beat Source for open format DJ community, and Loop Masters, Loop Cloud, and Plug in Boutique for music producers. So it's got everything. <laughs> it's the global DJ and producer yeah. community, it has an array of high quality audio products to choose from, including full song downloads, exclusive content from leading labels, a streaming music service seamlessly integrated into DJ software and hardware, and exclusive sound packs and plugins. So all the content is expertly curated on a weekly basis by a global team that helps define DJ culture. And they're everywhere. Berlin, Brighton, Denver, and Los Angeles. Micah, you have an incredible background. Thank you. Welcome for being welcome, you know, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be on the show for sure. And uh, yeah, been around the block, I would say. It's been 
at least over 20 years in the music industry for me so far. So you've seen it all. I can't <laughs> I can't wait to dive into that. Where, I haven't seen it all, but I've seen a lot. You yeah. see you've seen plenty, I'm sure. And I a lot of and a lot of changes. Oh, for sure. For sure. And a lot of changes. Mm. Yes, most definitely. And I want you to, to tell everybody a little bit of the background about how we got here. We'll do the rapid fire questions first. For anybody new to the show, you know, sometimes people do rapid fire questions at the end. Not us, um, not me, not ever. I love doing everything the opposite way you're supposed to do it. That's how we push boundaries. So we start off with rapid fire questions. And, um, you know, it's always amazing to see how, uh, you know, our guests answer. They're incredible and unique. And it really opens up the conversation as well, too. So are you ready without further ado? Let's go. All right, let's do it. No, this is uh, one and two are always my, well, all of these are my favorite, but I, I love how one and two can be related. Number one, if all music is completely wiped from the face of this earth, like it's just gone, Armageddon happened, I don't know. It's just like, hey, this is the thing, music's going. You can only save three albums to listen to for the rest of your life. What would they be? Three albums. Wow, that's not a lot. It's not and- a lot. Realistically, I probably have to choose two albums from one artist okay. or from one band because those are probably the most influential albums for me and I can still listen them on repeat. And that's Deepish Mode and mm. For the Masses and Violator because I wouldn't be able to decide which one. So I'll take them both. Wow. That's easy. Yeah. And then the third, well, maybe I can put two on one. You could, you could. Yeah, Yeah. why not? We can make the rules up as we go along. Okay, cool. Um, That's not sweet. Um, Nine Inch Nails. Ooh. Ooh. Out Spiraled, probably. Pretty Hate Machine is also one of my all-time favorites. So I'll make a best of compilation for them as well. (laughs) And uh, then... Faith No More, uh, Angelist. Wow, these are some great choices. Wow, and you know what? And, and for the for the future going going forward, maybe I'll I'll tell people like if you could or curate <laughs> curate the classics <laughs> from from three artists, you know who they be. Amazing. Okay, so question number two, which a lot of times is related to number one, if you could meet any person, living or non living, that you can interact with for one night. Who would they be? And when I and I always preface this, non-living can be any time in history that you would want, all the way to people who are still around now. Some people have chosen somebody from category from question one. So I put that out there. But it, uh, one person living or non that you can interact with for one night, who would they be? Mm, wow, that is right. a massive one to, to choose like from all time. Um, but who's always inspired me and I'd be super intrigued to to meet him is Richard Branson mm-hmm. of Virgin. So you actually told me just now that you worked for Virgin and I was like, wow, I always wanted to meet Richard Branson. So here we go. Um, I hope he's as inspiring as he seems. Isn't he going to outer the moon. space? The moon? Like, yeah. No? Probably. I, 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 and I say probably, I should just say definitely, because I feel like that's a man that if he wants it to happen, it's not if, it's when. <laughs> you know yeah, I, mean? I think I actually just read like somewhere, I don't remember that he's going to beat uh, Jeff Bezos uh, to go into space mm. for a week or something. So I mean, they're saying we must be really close. Yeah. Interesting. Crazy stuff. The race, the race is on between him, Bezos, and uh, Elon Musk, right? Totally. You need to ask Richard Branson which uh, music he's going to take. Uh, right. In space. That's a good question. Let's yeah. let, we'll, let's manifest them on the show, and then the three of us will do a show together. Please. please. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, For sure. Incredible. I I never got to meet him when I was a br- very briefly at, at Virgin, but that's one of the main reasons why. I, I sought out uh, Virgin Records just because a uh, very innovative individual and fearless in a lot of ways because it's like, hey, I, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen, but that's all the more reason to see where it goes. And I think that that kind of level of mentality is what makes life what it's all about and pushes the boundaries of creati- creativity, right? 
Totally. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, totally fearless. Right. And also, like, for his own life, I think um, he's taken so many risks, right. not only financially, not only in the business sense, but actually physically as a human being. I remember, like, when he did the um, hot air balloon around the world, right. stuff like right. that. It's just <laughs> insane. I mean, I yeah, know. it's I definitely know. inspiring. No limits to that one. Amazing. Okay. Question three. In your opinion, what's the best music-focused film of all time? Now, I also preface this. It can be a biography. It could be a documentary, a rockumentary. It could be fictitious. There's been a few people who have brought up one in particular that, uh, you know, is a fictitious movie, but still, you know, uh, music-focused in some way. Uh, do you have one? I probably know what that is, and I probably know that one. That's my favorite, too. Okay. Final. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's such yeah. a classic movie, though. It's um, epic. It's just, it's so spot on. It's so funny. One louder. I mean, that right. quote goes with me forever. Yeah. Love it. They actually made a, like a similar one in Germany called Fraktus. Mm. Uh, it's also pretty good. Like this fake band Fraktus. Um, <laughs> but the original is just, it's just perfect. Yeah. So That's good. awesome. I'm gonna have to check that out. Uh, I'll have to. Can I find it online? Not sure if you can find it online. <laughs> like Germans, they don't like they like their royalties, so right, probably right. not free. And um, not sure if it's dubbed or if you, if you have um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll go. I'll have to go hire somebody real quick. Like, can you just translate this real quick and give me the exactly, uh, the, ca yeah. the closed captions? That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe it'll come to Netflix. Yeah, um, but also. One movie yeah. that I found or documentary that's, I mean, inspiring is the wrong word, but that was really touching. And especially in my industry was the uh, documentary about Avicii. Mm, I haven't seen that yet, but that looks good. It's, I highly recommend it. It's um, especially having worked with so many artists uh, on the touring level as well. I used to have a booking agency and, you know, seeing all of these artists and their tour plans, mm -hmm. uh, schedules, it's quite insane what's going on. So yeah. um, I was deeply, deeply touched and when I watched that movie, yeah. I mean, the sheer importance to have open conversations about his touring lifestyle and, you know, the pushing of people and this has been spoken slightly about about the importance of taking a step back you know yeah. at, at times and like not constantly pushing the body uh lack of sleep alcohol i mean you name it everything like just that constant pushing the body this is just how important it is to like so the irony sometimes slowing down yeah. will actually speed up everything else better in your life right so yeah, it's crazy. And uh, I have to admit, I mean, I've seen this definitely on yeah. a smaller scale with artists that, you know, are close to to my heart or mm. that I've actually worked with uh, happening because, you know, you never know how long that run's going to last. Right. Uh, you never know when is the next gig. You never know when there's a pandemic around the corner right. and you need to save up, you know, so um, turning down gigs definitely is is hard for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think last year probably really helped a lot of people think about, let me rethink about how I balance events and touring and these things with other areas of my life that I can pay, you know, some really good attention to and yeah. even diversify. I, I've always been a fan of diversification yeah. for revenue, revenue streams, especially for your own art. Like there's so yeah, many sure. tools now, which we're going to talk about. Um, yeah. But uh, no. okay. And then, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, was going to say like, yeah, I totally agree on that. It's, um, that's like the hope that I have coming out of this pandemic, you know, that people are a little bit more mindful, a mm -hmm. little bit more strategic, a little bit yes. more take care, better care of themselves, you know? Yeah. So important. And, and I feel like, I feel like a lot, a lot of people are now having that internal dialogue and conversation with themselves. Like, okay, I got to look at a few things. I got to look at a few areas. At least that's my hope. So yeah, same here. So, okay. And then the final question an important book, podcast, uh, audible interview. It could be anything, something that just, that helps you really navigate your creativity and passion. I don't have anything that's super regular that I listen mm -hmm. to. I have to admit, uh, just because there's so much out there and I have such little time. And, uh, that's actually one thing 
that I want to improve my life is uh, getting more into into habits and um, doing stuff um, that really grows me as a person in my career. But um, like one book that really inspired me is the um, biography of Richard Branson, the first mm-hmm. one, losing my virginity, because I thought that was so incredible from where he came from to see what he achieved in such little time. And yeah, he's just a visionary. I think um, that was quite incredible when I read that. You know what I've noticed an observation without knowing this individual, but he's not attached to outcomes nor in his head about, from what I can tell, um, the energy is like, he's not really in his head about the money or like, the, the fear or the scarcity or any of these things that like when you bet on yourself, you know, it's just kind of yeah. like, all right, you know, this just feels right. I'm going with my gut, my intuition, my soul. This just feels right. Let's just move. Let's just move. Let's just move. He's, right. He's fearless and he's a visionary and he doesn't take no from for an answer, you know, right. and uh, he's not afraid to fail. And I think right. that's super important. Not being afraid to fail, to just do things because he wants to do them. And, and he sees that as the next step, you know, and I'm sure not everything has always succeeded that he's done. Um, not sure how, how his airlines are doing and the train and, and that kind of stuff, but just seeing like the progression and, and, and everything he does comes from passion, you know, and, um, wanting to achieve basically and taking risks. And I think that is something I for certain can, can learn from, you know, um, I'm definitely not such a huge risk taker, I think. <laughs> Even though I've taken great risks in my life. Um, but generally, I'm very German. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, uh, I get you. I, I've taken a lot of risks, more so calculated than others um, and strategic, you know, whereas I really admire, like I said, the Richard Branson of the world are like, to my God, I'm going to do it. Like. Like, I'll yeah. be like, is it in my gut or is it in my emotional body? And I'm just trying to like work through that, <laughs> you know, something yeah. like that. Right. Um, amazing. OK, well, this is the part where I, I, I really my by the reading of me doing your bio does it no justice. You're 20 years plus deep in this industry. I would love for you to share with our audience you know, how we got here, you know, how you're your head of artist relations now. But you had a starting point and you can go as back as, you know, birth <laughs> as far back. Uh-huh. Some, some people have gone even, you know, way back into time. But, you know, how do we get here? Like what what was what was the, the path? And it'll bring a lot more context to, you know, why we're, we're you know, the two of us are passionate about these topics yeah. that we'll be talking about today. Um, well, I've always been into music, so um. I always loved music. I didn't really know that there was a career in there. And I probably stumbled in there totally by, you know, coincidence. I actually had wanted to be a biologist. I wanted Mm. to study um, genetics. And uh, I would probably make a lot of money right now. And maybe I would have invented the um, vaccine for uh, Corona. But I didn't. I I chose techno, basically. So um, I lived abroad for four years in my teenage years. I lived in Kuala Lumpur and went to the international school there. And obviously the school was very different from from the school in Germany. So I did finish my German studies um, or my um, high school, but I was lacking chemistry and uh, physics. But I was very good in biology, so I still signed up for for biology and my studies and then went to university and realized, oh, my God, I am so behind on chemistry and physics. I literally understood nothing. I was sitting in the the classes and it was it was horrible and uh, realized basically, okay, it doesn't seem like I can catch up or my passion wasn't there enough for me to catch up three years of chemistry. So then I decided, okay, what am I going to do now? I was also in a small city in Göttingen um, because, yeah, you couldn't really choose which university you were going to get into. So basically I got into that one. Um, Didn't like the city at all. I was really upset. Um, Went home to my parents every weekend on, on 
and to have to Hamburg to go clubbing basically, and then dropped out of biology. Didn't know what else to do, so my dad was kind of like, "Study business, study business." I was okay. I just want to do something else, so I applied to business school and went to Berlin because also decided I was never going to move, like live in a small city again, at least not at that time. And yeah, studied business in Berlin. Then I went clubbing all the time. Basically, I was heavily into drum and bass in the 90s and uh, just basically went out every weekend, um, often by myself. So no drinking, no drugs. I rode a scooter, so I always had to stay sober. Stayed six day, six hours every night, um, went back home in the morning and uh I got to know in one of the clubs, the guy that used to work at the cloakroom. And because I often went by myself, I was bored at the beginning of the night because it usually takes two to three hours for the club to get going. But I had to go early because I was driving. I didn't want to fall asleep on the couch. I went there by myself. So I befriended the guy at the cloakroom. And this was a very famous club, the WMF. Um, it was quite famous back in the 90s. Not as famous as Berghain is right now, but probably even more influential in that kind of uh, area at the time. And so I befriended Philip. And one day he just said to me, you know what, next week I can't work. Can you take my shift? Mm. And I was, why not? And this is basically how my career started uh, by working at the cloakroom in a, in a club, like the most influential kind of club in Berlin at the time. So. There, obviously, you met like a lot of people, a lot of the DJs. Then the club had a record label, uh, WMF Records. And looking back, it had releases by Dixon, who is super famous right now, um, Ben Clock, artists like that. So I befriended the, the people that run the label. And when I was doing my master's, I had to also work work basically as an intern um, at a company and I wanted to, to write a thesis also about the music industry mm. and I became an intern at the label and did basically PR and learned PR from the grounds up and yeah that's basically how it started and then you start to network and yep. then I started working at another um, PR company um, later on one of the clients there was Richie Hartman's label Minus. And um, oh, yeah, I forgot. I worked also at like a small uh, label in between Zender Records, which was uh, for me very close to my heart. And uh, I started doing bookings there and then um, opened my own booking agency and PR agency. And then, yeah, I started to work for Richie Minus, uh, for Richie Houghton for, at Minus when he came to Berlin, basically. Um, that was 2006 and worked there for three years doing PR for him and for the labels Minus and Plus 8. Yeah, I worked there for three years, then um, started working for Ellen Alien, who is very famous uh, DJ in, in Berlin, and she really formed the music uh, scene in, in Germany and in Berlin, and did PR and marketing there for four years, and worked on some really amazing records from Paul Kalkbrenner, work Berlin, Berlin Calling, basically the um, movie soundtrack um, that he did, um, which basically broke his career or really accelerated his career. He was he was already. Um, doing really, really well before. Also another really good movie, I probably should have said, Berlin Calling, which stars Paul Kalkbrenner, which made him super famous. I highly recommend that. And I worked on the first Mood Art album, which was amazing. Um, Mode Selector, Telefon Tel Aviv, mm. Dylan. Yeah, crazy time. Lots of records, lots of work. But uh, really, really exciting. Went on tour with some of them for weekends and stuff, which was super exciting. So, yeah. And uh, then I decided, basically, I was getting a little bit bored of the PR carousel, chasing deadlines, basically doing the same thing all the time. It was very manual labor, not manual labor intensive, but, you oh, know, yeah. it was oh, yeah. at the time... It was always the same, you know, you mm -hmm. had to like sit there, I had to burn CDs, 
get test pressing, print out the one sheets, pack the envelopes, always make sure you, you make the deadlines for the actual physical magazines that still existed back then. Got a little bored after 10 years of doing the same kind of thing. And this was before you had streaming services. I still started working like with MP3s, mail outs, fat drop, all that kind of stuff, which was, which was cool. But yeah, it was always a little bit of the same thing. So decided to leave the B pitch and then for the first time actually applied for a job. And uh, it was a time in 2012 where streaming came to Germany for the first time. So you had Spotify that launched, you had Napster, you had Deezer. Yes. And actually a couple, couple ones that don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it was Simfire, I forgot. There are actually a few companies that didn't, didn't actually make it. And there was a Norwegian co company called Wimp. Very great name. That's right. And the but very great service. It was super cool. It was um, small company from yeah from Scandinavia as well, which was doing quite well in Norway and also in Sweden and Denmark. And applied there for a marketing manager position and had the interview. They asked me, you know, about conversion rates, and I looked at them. I don't know what a conversion rate is, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, I don't think I was going to get the job, um, right. but I got it. And they appreciate your honesty. Me. They liked your honesty. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. And not sure how many applications they had because, yeah, it was uh, the Spiro was the mother company. Wimp was the brand. I don't think anybody had actually ever heard of them in Germany. So, yeah, not sure how many interviews they had, but they hired me. And it was super exciting because... I could learn new things, you know, yes. like the streaming market was completely new, uh, especially in Germany. Germany is a tough market when it comes to digitalization. We like our bank accounts. We don't like credit cards. We don't like subscriptions. Uh, we don't like to give up like um, personal information. Right. So it was super challenging, but it was. It was a lot of fun because like we were a really small team. I'm still best friends with um, one of the editors in Germany. And um, yeah, it was a, was a really great time because things were moving, things were changing. But yeah, it can take a long time for people to adjust and oh, yeah. open up new ideas. It's, it's quite crazy. And yeah, then I had uh, one month its title which was very exciting and uh, very sad at the same time we had launched title already also um not in germany i think it was wimp at the time mm -hmm. but uh, in scandinavia it was already launched in the us we had launched in the uk we had launched and then G Jay Z bought the company right so we were all <laughs> super excited to have uh yeah to obviously be on the map all of a sudden, you know, we were such a small company. I think we were like five employees in Germany at the time. Wow. Um, and we were like, oh my God. And then we had like the German Grammys, uh, the Echo Awards in Germany. And I remember going there and going like, Jay-Z bought the company. Wow, <laughs> Jay-Z, this is so exciting. And oh my God, you know, it's so cool. And then a month later, unfortunately, they decided um, to close down the offices that were not in Oslo. So Oslo mm. was the headquarter in Europe, and then they shut down the German office, the Danish office, the Swedish office, and I think also Poland, main, yeah. And mm. then I wasn't working for Jay-Z anymore, but Jay-Z <laughs> had, had fired me, so I was trying to make the best out of that story. But yeah, and after Tidal, I worked very briefly at um, a speaker company or like an electronic consumer company called Teufel. They did, um, or they do on-fit speakers. You can actually see one behind here um, that are like, they're like the competitors nice. to Sonos, but do lossless. Okay. And Tidal yeah. was one of the compass companies that um, from the, not from the start, but very early on, focused on on high quality audio so that was quite exciting but that didn't really work out um wasn't really also my cup of tea um 
And then I applied for Beatport. There was a maternity cover that I applied for um, as labor manager. It wasn't going to last, at least I thought. And yeah, then I started working there in mm-hmm. January 2016. And I think the first all hands meeting one and a half weeks into my job uh, was the one where they announced the bankruptcy of SFX <laughs> and the company going into Chapter 11. So SFX, uh, where Bob Cameron was owned Beatport also. And mm. I thought, well, this is going to be a short stint. Um, last to come in, first to get out, right? <laughs> um, so I was pretty certain um, that I wasn't going to keep my job because there were like a lot of uh, redundancies, a lot of people losing mm-hmm. their job. Um, but I was lucky at the time that I was also like the, one of the only people at the company speaking German. Mm. So they decided to to keep me. So I was I was one of the lucky people who yeah wasn't let go. And now I'm at Beatport, and I started off as a label manager, and yeah, filled that maternity cover for a year basically. And then when Nikki came back, they had wanted to keep me, and then they basically created this new department, artist relations. I mean, it had been created a couple months before, but um, yeah, so that was that was quite exciting to basically be now in this department right from the start. I always love hearing people's journeys because you can, I think it was like Steve Jobs once said, you can't connect the dots. Looking back, you can, but yeah. while you're going through it, you, you, you can't always. But it, it, you know, even when you said I was lucky at the time, I was one of the only people speaking German. Were you lucky or were you just in the right place? You know, and it makes sense when you when you think about this uh, amazing journey that you had. At least it's just in my my mind, but I think yeah. it's the spiritual side of it. But I, I I really it's no coincidences, right? It's like you and you kept making shifts that felt right with your you know with your soul. Like all right, I'm done with PR. I'm done with this side. I need to learn more. And I also found that people who take the time that and it takes a little bit longer because they're learning the breadth and the the depth of all the aspects of an industry also have longer sustainability right over yeah. the long haul but like it gives you such a uh, it's almost like speaking multiple languages in a lot of ways you're like oh how do you know they're like oh i did a stint for four years over here <laughs> and i did three years yeah. doing that and it's like oh and so it, it almost makes sense why the value was seen in you in these different roles like oh because you know she comes with multiple languages in a lot of ways and is constantly molding and shaping and, and growing with an industry. So I could see how, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just looking back at, at as you're, you're, as you're giving the whole story, I'm like, that makes sense why they'd be like, Oh, they were downsizing, but they kept me. And like, I would see why they would, you know, when you look back, you're like, that makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, also, you know, people have always taken a chance on me. So, yeah, um, exactly. And sometimes it's kind of, you do what I said, like, you know, I don't like to take risks, but then I do take them, you know? So when I finished uh, my, my, basically my studies in, in business and I had done also two longer internships, one at a multinational company, uh, Lever Brothers, um, Unilever. And then I had also done one at like a very um, well-known um, advertising agency, Shots and Friends. And for both, they were interesting. And, you know, there would have been probably a more, not steady career because I've got a steady career, you know, but definitely the, the safe bet. It was definitely my father probably at the time would have much more um, preferred me to, you know, um, work for the company he worked for, which was Unilever. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got me an internship there. I mean, sure, I had to apply and they took me, but I'm I'm very certain that it helped that, you know, my dad worked there all his life. But I remember going through the assessment center there as an intern to basically uh, apply for a trainee position. And I just... I just didn't feel it. And I was thinking, you know, I'm I'm ambitious. I have drive. So I wanted to make it, you know, I didn't want it to get that um, position basically. But then again, I was sitting there like, well, if they do take me, how am I going to tell my dad? (laughs) Sorry, I'm not, I'm going to turn this down. Like, people have lost it, I'm pretty sure. And uh, so then I was like debating, okay, do I, do I actually 
try to fail, you know, in an assessment center. So they, they really don't take me or am I gonna, gonna go for it? And I decided to go for it and they didn't take me. So I was one of 2000 people who applied mm -hmm. for this um, inter uh, not internship uh, trainee program. I got into the last 20 that made the assessment center. And then I think I made it into the last group of, let it be six or something. And then they told me that the person that they went with was the person like, you know, you have like different kinds of assessment centers, like things you have to do. And the last one was like a group discussion. And I thought it was all about creativity, you know, like uh, how can we drive the brand and what are like formats, you know, and mm -hmm. things that we can do. And I felt really in line with the brand because you know my dad worked for it for all my life so mm -hmm. i was maybe like 25 at the time so i'd been with the brand 25 years of my life and then it, they told me they went for the person who was doing the protocol and who was quiet <laughs> and I, I was like wow yeah. yeah okay i thought you would have gone with the person with the best ideas and who was enthusiastic and um so this is actually a very good fit that I didn't make this, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny how, how life works mm -hmm. out like that. And the same thing was, not the same thing, but when I was working for the, for the advertising agency, I think that was like probably more interesting in a way. And I thought that that's what I had wanted, but you can't choose your clients. You can't mm. choose the clients that you work for. And right. you had to work really, really hard. The pay was bad um you had to work really long hours you had to work on weekends i mean not so much at the time i was lucky but if you had a pitch for a new client mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you had to work non-stop and mm -hmm. it didn't really matter who the client was you wanted that client and it doesn't matter if it's like a detergent if it's a toothpaste if it's mercedes mm -hmm. benz trucks it doesn't really matter and then we lost the pitch and I was really, wow, all the work I did was for nothing. Yep. And it was for a client I wasn't even into. Um, <laughs> this is supposed to be the rest of my life. Right. Um, maybe not. Uh, maybe this is really isn't what I want to do. And yeah. And again, it's, I always feel like, yeah, my career is a bunch of coincidences being at the right place at the right time meeting mm -hmm. the right person but then having the guts to speak up yes. um you yes. know making yourself heard that's usually how how mm -hmm. um yeah i got my jobs and and once in a while i've applied and i mean i didn't always get the job i applied for but uh sometimes i did yeah i totally i'm sitting here just like relating to you on multiple mm -hmm. levels. Uh, I, I have a saying that I always say that you can't run from what's meant for you, nor can you run towards what isn't. And yeah. because I had had a lot of ex very similar, I couldn't even break into corporate if I tried. I literally, people all the time, you know, they're surprised at, at everything, you know, in the direction I took. And I'm like, you realize I never had a corporate job? And they're like, get on, go on. I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. Like I, I even solved a multi-million dollar problem for one company and they, and, and <laughs> they ended up giving the job to somebody else, but they ended up using the exact strategy. I was like, well, you could do this and move that over here and you'd save the money right. there and then you'd actually have something more value. It was crazy. And I, it taught me what am I being protected from? Like maybe that that it's not an environment that's for me if that's the character and the behavior. You don't think about it when it's happening. It's almost like perplexing. Like you said, you're like, you went with, I thought I was being creative. I grew up with the brand. Like, wouldn't, wouldn't you want me? <laughs> you know, in, yeah. in a weird, in, 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 and not even, not even in, like in a logical, a logical way, right? Exactly. A very logical way of, I know the brand, family's in the brand, this is creative. That drives awareness, that drives sales. Am I missing something? <laughs> you know? And yeah. but but you can't run from what's for you. You can't run towards what isn't, right? And so interesting how that always works. And then, you know, and the and then the other part in there too is that like um because your mind was needed needed for more, 
right? Your mind was, your mind and creativity and expansion was needed somewhere else, was needed for more. And that was kind of, I think, a problem with a lot of companies is their inability to adapt and stay relevant and invigorate and pivot and innovate all these things. Even if what they do works for them, business is going to be very interesting watching where we go from here forward. Um, it's already been changing, but um, for sure. yeah, very, yeah, very I think cool. For me, I think for me, it's important that my passion, you know, that I can yes. work with my passion because yes. this is when I am really good, I think, you know, um, and when I'm convinced from a product or a brand or an artist, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that is quite important to me. Yeah. You know, so with B port, and I wanted to ask this because you've always been self aware, constantly seeing an industry change. You were ready to adapt to technology, even when you're like, Yeah, I don't know what conversion rates are, but can we, you know, yeah, that's fine, let's do it, you know? <laughs> so I feel like that that ability to constantly adapt to new emerging concepts. It's just in you. It's in your lifeblood. So with the state of where we're at now with emerging artists, what, what are things that you're noticing, especially given the more freedoms than we've ever had before, the more technology and tools than we've ever had before? What's going on in that world? Like it, from your perspective? Wow, that's that's a big, big thing. And Very. I think, going um, to tear. <laughs> it has really changed. You know, mm -hmm. when I look back, um 20 years of, of music industry it was very structured it was like there was really one certain path of of what you had to do and it was very difficult to you know to break and cross that level and also like even to like become famous or um you know super successful um you also had to really dedicate a lot of probably money and time into buying equipment, learning that equipment. Um, you know, it was very difficult to get your music heard. You, people were sending out CDs right. and that kind of stuff, you know, that went straight into the promo or the, the, the A&R pile, basically, which means the trash. <laughs> but... <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think now is the time where people can really take, you know, their own career in their own hands. Everything seems so democratized in a way, but also overwhelming. So yes. the challenges are definitely different. I think back in the day, you really had to be tenacious. You really had to be mm. focused. Or like somebody actually, somebody that was very um, good at the job ran across you, found you and made you famous, you know? But yeah. otherwise, I think you had to work really, really hard to to get your music even heard and out there. And I think, or even make the music, you know? I mean, if I look at the studios of, of my, you know, artist friends from back in the day, they had to spend a lot of money to, to buy analog equipment to, to produce. And now with, you know, having... Brands like Ableton, where everybody can produce. I mean, Avicii started on Fruity Loops, you know, and um, <laughs> you can well. you now actually, you know, don't need any analog equipment. And this is also like super interesting now working like Loop Masters and uh, Loop Cloud and Plug and Boutique, where there's companies now just focusing on making like these tools and making the artist's life so much easier, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I feel now people can have a different kind of creativity because before that, it's like you had to sit down, you had to watch tutorials maybe, or um, even try on your own, you know, to make like these, these synthesizers work and all this kind of stuff. And, and now you just need a computer. You can be anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. You can have a low income and you can really make incredible music. So um, I think that has really changed. Also, how to, to have your music distributed or, you know, heard has changed. Uh, you don't need a label anymore. You don't need a distributor anymore with companies like CD Baby, um, DistroKid, um, having all of this DIY um, possibilities. I think that's, that's really incredible because 
yeah, you don't need to have your, your music signed. You can just produce it in Ableton, then you throw it into Lander, you know, get it mastered, then you upload it to SoundCloud. Then, yep. you know, you have Spotify that maybe picks, you know, a track from somewhere uh, on their emerging artist program and boom, all of a sudden you're totally out there and and can become famous. I think that is super exciting. I think the possibility for everybody to be there, um, to put themselves out there is incredible. But of course, the noise also right. is much louder. The competition is heavy. There's even more music out there. At Beatport, we release 25,000 tracks a week. Oh, my God. And that's just Beatport. I don't, I don't even want to know what it's on, on Spotify because, I mean, Beatport is just electronic music. So it's just one part of the genre, you know, and even a small part of the genre because we are mainly in working with independent labels and distributors. We do, of course, work with majors, but um, they're not wow. prime, prime focus. Yeah, it's crazy. So after that noise, you have to be very active on social media, I guess. Grow your fan base. And that is an up and that's a down because yes. for artists, it's not for every artist. There's a lot of extroverted people out there that love it, you know, that spend all the time on social media. They do, I don't know how many stories a day, they thrive on it. But I know a lot of artists out there that are really, really struggling because they feel... It has nothing to do with the art. It feels that basically deprives them of so much and they're just not into it. And it takes away the focus basically from the music. Right. So it's a struggle. It's not easy. You know, the, the, the concept of social is a very um, interesting and passionate topic for me because I've always been digital. I don't like the abuse when it's used in an abusive manner or a comparison, or a, who can entertain the masses more, or a numbers game and all this other stuff. Yet at the same time, I grew hundreds of thousands of people online in my own right, not bought, all organic, and from a community aspect. So it's a very interesting, I'm somewhere weirdly in this middle. And the one thing that I have told artists is if you could think about it as like this, it's like, imagine if you were in front of doing your music in a studio and maybe you had like a, a, a mini audience or whatever, or even a thousand or 2000, whatever it is, just that relationship between you and them, forget everything else, the noise, the, the, the people, the, the, the antics, the what gets you famous, the being judged by numbers, whatever. And if you can open up your art even more just to like the one-on-one, one-on-ten, one on ten, one on a thousand, whatever, there's something that you can you can then stay in the vibe and the almost in the energy of what you're creating because you've kind of weirdly created this community bubble within this massive <laughs> weirdness <laughs> that is social media. And I think that's the way to stay sane is to be the creator, not the consumer. And when you're the creator, having that community of like, oh, hey, like you guys want to see how like, I do this with the beats? Like, here, I'll, I'll show you guys. And almost pretend that there's nobody else out there. It's just you. And, you know, which I, I know in a lot of ways, that's why people, when they use like Twitch um, or Discord, you know, um, they get to have that more kind of intimate setting or whatever, yeah. which is really cool. And I, and I think that that's where these newer tools allow the artists like, hey, I totally get you. Like, yeah. uh, you know, go ahead. I think that's really, really good advice. Um, I'm certainly struggling with the social media because I do kind of need it in my job, but right. um, I dread going on Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's like I have a heavy case of FOMO, so um, I always feel like I'm missing out. You know, my life yeah. is not glamorous enough and, and that kind of stuff. So I find it doesn't give me energy anymore. It basically just sucks it out. So I'm trying to stay away from it. And also I'm always, I very, very rarely post something mm. because I always feel, um, does the world need to see this? Is, uh, is, this, is this interesting to the world? I, Probably I not. Totally so get you. Why are you posting this? This would be pure vanity reasons. So yeah, let's not do that. I but for the artists, it's hard because, yeah, it's the bread and butter. You know, they have to be part of it. And I think with the community aspect, what you mentioned, 
this is also what made SoundCloud really, really big, um, what mm. really worked. And also, I think MySpace was pretty good at that. Yeah. Oh, much better than, than Facebook now. I think Facebook right now is probably dead, you know? <laughs> um, I still use it because I'm in my mid 40s, but um, a lot of the young kids, um, they don't. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely challenging. Um, and yeah, if, uh, I agree with like the one on ones. But then again, you know, if you have a lot of fans and a lot of traffic, yeah. it's a couple of time. It's a lot of time that you need to invest in there. But um, I see also what a lot of people are doing now, like through the pandemic. And I've a lot of seen a lot of artists like really embracing it is like doing studio sessions, yes. uh, Twitch jams. Um, a lot of artists have launched their master classes yes. and there's different yes. concepts there. You yes. know, you have like recorded ones you can sign up to. You have uh, Zoom calls like with multiple artists. And then also I've seen like one artist, Alex Stein, he does actually one-on-one -on -one tutorials and it's going really, really well, he said. Um, and I find that great, you know, because that's probably not the, the model to super scale you know where you're gonna have thousands of people but uh, he decided for that model and it works really well for him and i think it's actually really, really cool because then you can have that one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. uh, with a producer that actually shows you you know the ropes yeah uh so many so many great points i think uh because of last year instead of the lifestyle content it turned a lot of uh, artists into saying okay you guys want to see me like I'm, I'm in home, I'm in the studio. You guys want to see like what I do? And everyone's like, yeah, we've been wanting to, you know. Um, and I think that that also made a lot of artists think about like, did you even really want to see all the crazy lifestyle stuff before? Or was that just in my head and I was just competing with industry? I, I ask my audience a lot of questions and it's amazing how much you find out from just like in marketing and business. Like, don't make it complicated. Ask the people what they want. And yeah. of course, you have to be in alignment with it. You don't just do it just to do it. But like, you're like, that's what you wanted. <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's what you wanted the whole time. And it drowns out the noise, right? And it is about connection at the end. Yeah. Of the day, right. Because yeah. I mean, when the pandemic first hit and we we're all confined to our, our apartments, and especially in artists, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of them, they're used to uh, performing in front of thousands of people every weekend or every day almost. So that went missing um, mm -hmm. for everybody. And it's not just about the thousands of people and the money, you know, that you're losing, but also about having this connection. And I did see that like, a lot of people were doing a lot of Twitch shows and, mm -hmm. and trying also to, to give back a little bit, you know, with their knowledge and and yeah. trying to educate people, but also starting a dialogue. And I think that's that's really, really great. And I think also like Clubhouse worked a little bit yeah. um, with that. It's died down quite quickly, which is, right. you know, it's a bit of a shame. Yeah. But no, it's, I, I know uh, what you mean. <laughs> it was one of these things like more noise. Okay, now I have to do right. uh, clubhouse talks and I have to be there because I have to grow my profile and um, mm -hmm. it's never ending. Something new always right. comes around the corner. So, 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 so true. Uh, you know, I'm, I, it was interesting having conversations with emerging artists last year because they, with so much money coming from the live events and the touring, it was cool for them to kind of geek out with me in a way of like, so you're digital? I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, and they go, well, if we could just charge on Twitch, doesn't that kind of like save us on like a lot of costs? And I'm like, maybe. And they're like, and with e -com, can't we also launch our merchandise? And I'm like, yes. And they go, and then can we also just do like a Patreon account? And, and then we could also charge for like our beats over here. And I'm like, go on <laughs> and it was just interesting it was interesting to see them embrace digital in a whole new way other than just the social component of like sure minute, like have i had a lot more power than i thought i'm like yeah you did actually <laughs> you really really did yeah right and and it's also about diversifying as I said yes. before, you know creating new revenue streams because music is such you know a passionate topic it will always be there and I have to admit, you know, um, at Beatport, when the um, pandemic first hit, we were really, really worried, you know, mm -hmm. we were just like, who's going to buy downloads to, you know, we sell mainly to DJs, 
for the, you know, the music to be played in clubs. Who's going to now buy music and plus people are losing their jobs. So they're not going to have any income. And why would they spend it on stuff that they don't need? Well, we were very, very wrong. Oh, yeah. Um, I have to admit, and all of us, we, I mean, thankfully so, you know, I've probably been more busy than mm -hmm. I've ever been. I have so much work to do. The numbers are great, you know, and so much also, it was so good for our business in the sense that people weren't traveling all the time. I had managers that were replying to emails. I could even have Zoom calls with artists would usually be touring you know, five days a week and then the rest e either recovering or in the studio. So it was never a priority for them to connect with us directly, you know, just because they didn't have the time. And I, I get that, you know. So for our business, it's been really, really good. Also having, yeah, Loop Masters and Loop Cloud, reaching out to artists, offering them now to do sample packs to, you know, sell their samples because now is the time they're at home, they're at the studio, they can actually do this. They're interested in, in having the mm -hmm. revenue. And uh, yeah, that's really, really exciting. And we've really grown our subscription business of our DJ streaming service, Link. And uh, I think that was also due to the pandemic because people had time to check it out. There are a lot of video streams going on, not only on a mm -hmm. professional level, but also, um, you know, Zoom parties with friends. So people wanted new music. We're doing radio shows, podcasts, so much. So, um, yeah, it's been been really, really great. And um, having also all of these integrations, we work with mm -hmm. Denon, with Pioneer, with uh, Serato. We've just launched our, our tractor integration. So that's really cool to see also artists embracing new technology. You know, it's not club ready yet that people will be using it in a club, but I've had a lot of feedback of, artists coming back like wow this is so amazing i'm using this for my twitch shows and i know that like these artists especially when they use serato or tractor where you already need to bring a computer that they will use this um when the gigging starts again and mm -hmm. um i just heard this really great story i saw macio plax the other day mm -hmm. in madrid and he is playing on the new denons and the new denons they have a touch screen, they're Wi-Fi compatible. So you can literally log into your link account and you can access 9 million tracks um, from our store. And you can do that while, while you're playing in a club, you know, as long as you have internet or um, yeah, like, a, like an internet connection. Now, if you don't have a track with you because you forgot to, to update your USB, you can just log into your account and there you have it. And he basically, he wasn't even aware that he had his own link account um, because he doesn't check emails. Um, yeah. But he was touring with uh, one of the technicians from Denon and uh, he spoke to him. He was like, man, I really wish I had that one track right now. I really want to play it, but I forgot it. I don't have it. And then the technician was one second logged into the Denon's with yeah. his uh, Vport account and there it was, and he could play it straight away. Mm. So I think that's that's really inspiring to see yeah. what technology can do. Um, it's a little scary at times, but um, and we're very mm. far from being finished, you know. And this is really really cool to see um, all the new ways people can make music, produce music, um, distribute music, um, sell music. Um, access music i think that's that's really incredible you you know interestingly enough i was not surprised that you guys were very busy last year because artists slowing down from the live to be like what do i want to do online people at home for well i have some moments to myself finally some things I want to get back to and music never goes away. <laughs> so there's this like beautiful cocktail of like, you know, and then doing things, you know, from home in a whole new way. DIY projects at home became a, on a whole new level and it definitely incorporated a lot of technology. So yeah. talk about, you know, ironically, but not so ironically, being in the right place at the right time as, as a company. I mean, it makes perfect sense because it's like, yeah, you know, all these fun things that we've been working on for like all these years 
you guys yeah. can use them right now. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, hey, and you're, it's definitely you're, accelerated our business, right? both from like the customer side, but also I think like from our development side, like really embracing the new technologies and mm -hmm. really like putting uh, also the power behind them. You know, like we're hiring yeah. always like a lot of engineers and we're mm -hmm. really progressing into new technology, you know, as a download store, which with a very stable business. So we're probably one of the only companies, you know, selling downloads that was growing and not, you know, declining. So, um, but we still have to be aware of, well, where is this going? You know, mm -hmm. how sustainable is this? And you see this with the new kids, you know, growing up now. They've got a mobile phone, they have Spotify, they have Netflix. Um, they don't even know what a download is. And it doesn't matter if it's a movie or if it's um, a music file. So yep. we had to get ready for those new customers, basically, mm -hmm. that want a solution that works for them. And they don't care about, I mean, they might care about sound quality, but, you know, it's it's quite funny how music is seems to be sometimes very uh, back words they're right. not like the most innovative or fast adapters you'd think so but they're not they're very protective of the workflows you know if you remember how how things shifted from the cassette to the cd from right. the cd to the mp3 um or vinyl you know like always being there it's it was always painful it was so painful switching artists from one format to the next mm -hmm. And they were never embracing it. They really they tried to hold on to their workflow as long as possible and mm -hmm. coming up with all sorts of excuses, you know, sound quality, this, um, right. convenience that. Um, but yeah, the new generation, I think it's all about convenience and accessibility. So um, yeah, we have to provide like a, a product that, that they're into, you know, otherwise they'll, they'll go someplace else. Some of my my greatest moments were watching businesses uh, and industries cling to their workflows and how they do things. And I'm like, you know, I did the numbers on this. This is actually being way more profitable for you. I'm like, no, no, no. This is how we always do it. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it's, it's incredible. All right. I guess, <laughs> I guess in a way it's human nature. But it's very kind it's of pioneers and visionaries. And this is where Richard Branson yes. comes back, you know, where yes. you think. You need people like that yes. to really take a risk and say, you know what, even if the numbers don't make sense right now, they we're will. still going to do it because we yes. believe that this is the future and yes. they take a leap, basically. Yes. And, and then it takes always the industry at least five years um, Minimum. to basically follow. And right now, this also I find has accelerated. If you just look at NFTs, you know, if you just look, as the past half year yes. of, of what has happened in that market, but also how how quickly that market um, declined as well, but um, like to a certain extent, but also just for people seeing other artists and big names to invest in this mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. take a leap of faith and being, well, I'm going to do this, you know, no matter if it's stupid or not, you know, but I want to be technologically advanced yes um and now this is basically opening up a whole new way of how to distribute money or how to use oh, these yeah. nfts you know it's not it's already adapted quite quickly yeah. in the past half year you know coming from well this is what an nft is mm -hmm. don't make that much money and a lot of the stuff was for vanity or you know for for a quick buck and now we're already in the second state where you can go, it's like, okay, well, what can we do with this? That's yes. creative. Utility. You know? mm -hmm. And that's going to be good for the industry. It's going to be incredible for the industry. Um, I loved watching NFTs rise because I've been in crypto and blockchain for uh, f almost five years. And so seeing the utility of now putting the, the, the next steps together, people can say like, Oh, now I can see how I exchange money. Oh no, well, now I can see how I can mint my work for transparency and authentication and control distribution. It's like you start to see the people's wheels turn. And what I loved about NFTs is like, you know, it's like anything, right? 
something new comes out. It's a shiny toy. Everybody runs to it. And um, the sustainability of it will be what will happen, util- the utilization of it over the next five to 10 years. So to your point earlier about like always taking risk um, for where we're heading, not so much you know, how things have been. Um, it, it, even yeah. if the numbers aren't there yet, they're going to be, NFT, we will all be tokens. We're all gonna be paid, we're all gonna be token is, tokenized. Like in my opinion, we're all gonna be tokenized. Me, the creator, you, the creator, the artist, the creator, everybody, like the direct correlation between the creator and the consumer will take out a lot of other components that sometimes, you know, the gatekeepers and whatnot. So it, it but it needs, to build on utility and you always get the the first people and music was such a great music and art was such a great way to show like oh there's a lot of possibilities here and then after that dies down it allows okay what else can we do yeah exactly and then we go from there right yeah <clears throat> what's what's good for the mass uh, consumer basically or for yes. the normal consumer let's say that yes Yes. It's like introductory, like, hey, did you guys know about this before? And like, I haven't. What is this? I'm seeing this everywhere. I'm like, okay, at least we can have a discussion, though. <laughs> it's like when Napster yeah. first came out, we're like, yeah, what is it? And I'm like, oh, okay, at least you've heard of it. <laughs> you know. With B part, I wanted to ask this too, um, because you basically gave like the blueprint a few minutes back when you're like, nowadays you can do this, then you can upload it here, then you can distribute it here, you get it pressed here, and then you push the button over here. Um, so hopefully everybody picked up on that earlier. <laughs> you basically gave the blueprint. But with Beatport, more specifically, like you guys have been positioned for this for a long time and you've been doing it, but how do how are artists, you know, um, launching their music and selling their music and, 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 and establishing a footing in their career with Beatport? Um, Beatport, I have to admit, is still, I mean, old school is the wrong word, um, but like we work a little bit different than, um, the rest of the distribution platforms mm-hmm. or DSPs on Beatport, you actually need to be on a label. So you're an artist okay. and then you need to be signed to a label. And that's mainly because in electronic music, the label still holds a different kind of value. It's like, um... What's the word? Um, like a seal of approval, basically, mm-hmm. you know, a label is a brand. So if you think of like mm-hmm. major labels, it doesn't really usually matter to the um, to the consumer if the artist has released on Sony, Warner, BMG, um, you know, all of the above. But in electronic music, the the imprint, the, the label still has such value, you know, it's like there's such great labels out there that every artist wants to release on just if you think about mute you know for example or um oscuton um there's so many compact yeah seal of approval basically so on beport you the artist needs to be signed to a label or run their own label so you can basically make your own label if you want to then you need to have a digital supplier a distributor basically that uh, will deliver the music to beport so as an artist you cannot direct, like, create a track and upload that to Beatport. That doesn't work. We do work with um, some DIY platforms like DistroKid, but we don't take all of their content because it's just it's just too much content. So we do try to have high quality content on on our store, and um, yeah, then you need to make sure that that supplier basically sends over the music to be poured in a timely manner you need to have at least two weeks before then it gets ingested in our back-end system and then it's made available on beatport either as a pre-order where you can buy the music in advance but you can't download the music or then like as a as a um, release on on the store so that's usually how it works and still and still high demand twenty five thousand tracks a week yeah, about wow. 10,000 releases a week. Yeah. Wow. And it's probably more now that number is a little old just because, yeah, I think more and more people are actually making music. And yeah, um, yeah it's it's intense. And then we do have, I don't know, I need to count, probably about six curators that mm-hmm. listen to the music um, that gets pitched to us. So we have a label management team that speaks to the supplier. The supplier has priorities. They go every week. They're like, okay, what are the high priority records for us? Depending on the artist, the label, or actually like the quality of music. 
they pitch that to our label team. Then the label team gets together with our curators and mm -hmm. they then decide on which releases get featured where on the store. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't delivered your music on time, there's no feature for you. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> Sorry, you failed. <laughs> too much music out there um, and not enough space. Really interesting about what you're saying about the label um, part. I guess I better make my own label than put me as the first artist under it. <laughs> you know? No, but, but it's like, but, um, and I, I like to think that labels are also changing a lot of the way that they, at least the ones that I've talked to where they're, they're changing their models. Well, the ones that I've talked to, like they've always been really for the artists. So like their models have always been kind of more supportive for the artists given, in the, you know, meaning like, Hey, as an artist, like you need to do all these things that will take your time. And so, but we put you more at the forefront than kind of maybe how labels used to for many decades. So, you know, still a, a, a reason, you know, but it's also nice to see how they're also constantly changing and innovating. Like, hey, here's how we can help manage artists in a newer emerging environment where, you know, they've done a lot of the work because of curating the audience and, and whatnot and, and, um, you know, the power has shifted a little bit, but let's support them in the process, you know? So where do you see music creation and publishing heading? Um, I mean, I know that that's a, if you had a crystal ball, right? <laughs> but, but like, you know, just, you know, you brought up NFTs and I think there's gonna be a lot more with blockchain. You know, what else? Or do you want to expand on that at all? Wow, I mean, that is a big question. Right? I think, um... Definitely, we've moved into a little bit more artist-focused area um, or time. So I think also on Beatport, we'll, we will be adapting, you know, but we are an established company that is maybe not sometimes as, or can't change, you know, as quickly as we'd like to, um, especially if you have an e-commerce store um, adapted to your business that needs to to run and basically needs to sell um music but we will be going into um also artist services um mm. where artists can basically participate a little bit more directly that they don't need to go through the label um i think we'll be extending to add more data that's going to be available to um the artists and the labels so maybe even monetizing that depending on what the need is, that kind of stuff. And uh, I think publishing is super important. Uh, we've actually launched a publishing, not company, but we're working with Centric together. Uh, so we're doing like a joint venture where we're offering publishing to artists uh, because it's, it's really cool because we have good rates. Centric is a great company that's focused on electronic music and you can actually claim direct publishing from Beatport when it wasn't um, possible before, so you get your money quicker. So if you're really doing about well on Beatport, it uh, actually makes a lot of sense, you know? So I do think um, that that is becoming more important, that artists are becoming more aware. I think a lot of people are not even aware about publishing, how important it is in electronic music. It's really important because often, you know, there's only one artist, you know, you don't have like an orchestra, you write the music yourself. So all of that income is just for you directly. So yeah, please sign up to publishing everybody. Right. Um, and also it's important because you can pub claim publishing not only from radio plays, from neighboring rights, from um, film sync, but also from your gigs. So a lot of people don't even realize that, that you can claim publishing from gigs. And that's a lot of money that's wow. left in the banks of the PROs because there's uh, deadlines where you have to claim your money. And then either that money goes into a pot, you know, where it's distributed to the highest selling artists, or actually the companies can, can claim it for themselves. So mm -hmm. I think... That's super important. And um, I think there's a really great companies out there now with short term publishing because that's one of these myths that's been around. Or actually, I mean, it used to be that case. You know, you would sign publishing for 10 years basically. And then you used to get like a few thousand as an advance. But 
artists were so small, you know, back in the day that they took that money or that money was so much for them, you know, at the time. They basically sold away the rights for, for 10 years and a lot of people have been regretting this. And um, there's so many good things out there right now. Yeah, I think it's mm. important for the artists. I think they need to educate themselves, yes. you know? And I even see that managers don't necessarily know everything, you know? Um, they might be good in one aspect or one topic, but then, yeah, don't need to know or don't know about about publishing for instance mm -hmm. and i think that's it's quite important and also again like coming back to the artists being a little bit risk averse at some point they'd rather not sign a publishing deal now than signing a bad one you know for a short term like mm -hmm. it needs to be short term you know so they'd rather wait a year of debating who to sign with or signing at all than signing for a year to anything you know and then sometimes it takes three years and some of those deadlines are two years mm -hmm. so that money is gone it's completely gone it, you know you bring up such a great point i i tell people in this day and age there is no reason for no education period end of story i don't want to hear it and pe people ask me all the time they're like well how'd you figure that out i'm like google <laughs> YouTube. Are you kidding yeah. me? You know, and yeah, I mean, obviously I was able to pick up on it a little bit faster if it's related to digital, but you know, because of how many years of knowing what to Google and what to look for, but still like there's no reason. And anytime I, I go into any new area and you want to learn more about it and we all should take time to respect any industry enough to carve out our own path and manage a, a, and be accountable for what we're producing, marketing, distributing, everything in this world. And there's tons of education out there now more than ever and, and tools such as Beatport and others for, yeah. um, you know, for these things. So this has been an incredible, Micah, absolutely incredible. I told you, you don't even realize that the time goes by fast. You don't even want to know, want to know yeah, well, how, 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 how far we went. We're um, over an hour, right? Hour 20, I told you. I told hour 20, you. no way. <laughs> hour 20, it's incredible. Crazy. It's absolutely, it's absolutely great. But it, it, but it happens, and especially with great discussions, especially I think this is just really much needed information too for a lot of artists out there. Like This is a time where it's like, hey, with a lot of freedoms and um, and creativity come a lot of responsibilities and accountability. Yeah. And so now more than ever, yes, you can do all kinds of things, but now more than ever, you also have to be very, you know, proactive in the management of, you know, what you're producing and creating and marketing and all these things. And there's no excuses. Yeah, sure. I didn't know that. Like you could have sat and read that. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. What, and and a manager doesn't doesn't necessarily mean you know that they're mm -mm. gonna do a great job, but you're nope. signing off ten to twenty percent of mm -hmm. of your income. So yep. um, yeah, educate yep. yourself for always, sure. Always. There's so much out there. So many blogs and yeah. newsletters and websites and tutorials. It's yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, anybody listening, by the way, we some of our episodes. Uh, this is a perfect episode where we're covering this, like. This is a great tool. There's and and Micah brought up earlier too about um, there's great master classes on like oh here's how you do specifically your options for publishing or here's how you do <laughs> you know yeah you know and there's some great stuff going on out there. Where where can everybody find you? I know you're not. You said it. I, I'm gonna push your the the boundary here and say okay. Where can everybody find you specifically on social and then um, also Beatport and like and they can reach out to you et cetera. Sure. Uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram under Minimal Micah mm -hmm. and also on, on LinkedIn at Micah.Nolte. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it on Beatport. Um, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. I mean, Beatport.com. You can Beatport. find out my email if, you, if, if you're smart. So I'm not going to say anymore. Perfect. Um, you're absolutely correct. I always tell everybody, you know, um, the ones who work a little bit harder, you're like, ooh, exactly. you found you, 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 you're actually like driven by something. Okay, good. We can talk. This has been incredible. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. Um, and just, you know, your background and then the passion side, the tech side, uh, the experience has been incredible. Um, really, really, really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure and it was great. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. And sit tight for one second. But for everybody listening, you guys, uh, Michael Nolte, um, 
M E I K E N O L T E. So there, I'm, I'm helping you guys along the way uh-huh. on, on LinkedIn or minimal Micah on uh, Instagram or Twitter. That's where you can find her. And then, of course, beatport.com, beatportal.com, beatsource.com, pluginboutique.com, loopcloud.com, forward slash uh, cloud, and then loopmasters.com. There's a bunch of tools for you <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking for some. And exactly. uh, Mike is a great resource. So really, truly appreciate all of you guys tuning in every single week. And all the feedback has been phenomenal. Thank you guys so much. I mean, it means a lot to our movement um, and to the contribution of music culture. We're really um, trying to show the fullness and totality of everything that's going on, not only from an artistic, but a, a creative and a, and a professional and all these different things. Uh, and we love the feedback. Please, uh, when you get a chance, five-star re- review. Apple, they love it. They expand our show because of it, so we always are grateful for that. Uh, again, you can find us on all major platforms at We Are or Love, and then myself at Matt Goddisman. Reach out, send a DM, text. I'm very community-driven. I love to hear from you guys. Oh, and everybody that's listening to this on Apple or Spotify or you know Google Play, iHeartRadio.com, all these places. If you want to watch this interview, I always remind our our um, uh, audience that if you want to watch this, you can watch us on our Or Love YouTube channel. Uh, we can see this video. You can interact there. Leave some messages there as well too. Love to hear from you. And uh, we really, really, truly appreciate you guys. And we're out.